Good evening. If everyone would please go ahead and take their seats, we'd like to get, get started, please. Again, my name is Sharon Goldblatt. I'm your chair for the Key Communicators, and I welcome you here tonight. How many of you here are new to the Key Communicators? Wonderful. So glad to see you. That's really our goal, to make certain that we're bringing new faces and, and uh, allowing more people to understand what we have to offer within the district, what, what are the new updates, give you the information so you can take that information back to your campuses. So we're very, very pleased to see you tonight. We have a lot of information here for you. Just want to tell you just a moment that we really want you to be able to understand what's going on tonight. There is a lot of information that's going to be given to you, but we will not be able to take a lot of questions. We'll be able to take a few. But um, if there are additional <coughs> questions, please look at your agenda. You've got some information on the communications department on your agenda, whether you've got Leslie Range Stanton, who's standing right there. Hello, Leslie. And um, as you came in, you saw Jamie Engel, and she, either of them will be able to direct you to the correct person to get your questions answered. So just jot them down. If you do get to ask them, fine. If you don't, please continue to to pursue your answers because that's why you're here. We want you to get the, the, your questions answered. I do want to introduce um, some of the, the team that we have to, that put together these events. Um, we've already met Leslie and Jamie in the, in the hallway, but if, if the, my committee would uh, please stand. I'm seeing at the back of the room, Francis Foss, Angela Miner, and Rhonda Snyder. Uh, we, the, the ideas and some of the, uh, the um, pro uh, product and the presentations are generated by the, this group of ladies, so please give them a thank you. So again, if, if, there's, um, if you have not already met with your principal on your campuses, please do. Take the opportunity when you go back and say this is the information we were provided and determine what the means that will work on your campus to share that information. It may be at a PTA meeting, it may be through your newsletter, it may be various ways that you can share the information, but please don't keep it to yourself because that's your job for us, is to share that information with the people on your campus. And you will be able to go onto our website and find all of the information, whether it's a PowerPoint or a handout, um, that will be there available for you on the website at Key Communicators on the PISD website. So look there when you get home also. There will be also a video. So if some of your people were not able to come tonight, they will be able to view the video later. Any questions? Wonderful, so we're going to allow you to meet a lot of new faces, I hope, and some, some friends that are going to be uh, working with you in the future. I'm going to introduce now Nancy Humphrey. Nancy will come uh, forward and introduce our, our Board of Trustees. Nancy, welcome. Thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm Nancy Humphrey, I'm the President of the Board, and I'm so glad you guys are here tonight, and I always want to extend the open invitation for you to ever reach out to any of us on the board because that's what we're here for so we um, and when you go to my PIS or when you go to PISD.edu look at the leadership team and you'll find board and our emails are attached to that so anytime y'all need us just give us a email so I will introduce uh, the board vice president this is David Stolle and our board secretary is Mike Friedman 
And I also have Missy Bender, trustee. And Marilyn Hinton, trustee. And we have two other trustees that couldn't be here tonight, Tammy Richards and Carolyn Mobius, but they, um, they had other engagements they had to get to tonight, but we are all available for you. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being a participant as key communicators. And I'd like to introduce now to you our wonderful superintendent, Richard Mapkin, and he's gonna introduce the cabinet. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, <clears throat> I really do appreciate the school board and, and their, uh, what they do for the district. They, they put in a lot of time uh, and they do my evaluation. So uh, <laughs> I really appreciate them. Uh, no, and uh, I think some of them will be leaving. I, we, we are all over the place tonight. We've got a football game going on at Clark. We've got some presentations that we're making on the tax ratification election. So they're running in some different directions too and the other board members are also taking care of business tonight. I do want to uh, <clears throat> introduce my staff, the cabinet that works directly for me and really does uh, all the day-to-day -day work. Uh, Dr. Kathy Galloway, Associate Superintendent for District Services. Kathy, if you'll stand. Kathy's over, <clears throat> Kathy's over uh, human resources, uh, security, uh, uh, food and nutritional services, transportation, distribution, um, a lot of the operational parts of, uh, of the business and I uh, appreciate the job and the manner that uh, Kathy goes about her job. Steve Fortenberry is Associate Superintendent for Business and uh, Facility Services. Steve, you'll stand. <laughs> uh, Steve's, a, Steve's a certified public accountant, has been in the school business for uh, more years than you can count. Uh, we, uh, he filled my role as, uh, as Chief Financial Officer uh, when I uh, gravitated up to the superintendent's position, but uh, we really appreciate Steve uh, uh, being on staff and things have, have moved seamlessly uh, through the finances and the facility building program. Uh, we have Jim Hurst, Associate Superintendent for Academic and Technology Services. Jim's a, a uh, <clears throat> Jim uh, is a real fixture. A lot of you have seen Jim. Jim's over all our academic uh, services, uh, special education, uh, 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 instructional uh, management, our career and technology program, uh, our technology services. And as you know, there's there's no one that has better technology in the in the state than us. The assessment department uh, falls under Jim. Uh, and, and it, he is really uh, critical to what we uh, try to accomplish in a, in a comprehensive education pre-K through 12. And uh, we've come so many years, I think uh, uh, Jim's been in the district 17 years, 18 years, uh, and uh, uh, really has brought our technology from zero to, to 100. So uh, we all appreciate that. Uh, Patty Meyer, Associate Superintendent for Campus Services. Uh, Patty, some, some of you know Patty, if you had kids come through the system. Patty was a longtime principal in the district. Uh, Patty now is over all campus services, which encompasses all the principals, report up through them. If you have a problem with the principal, call Patty. She'll give you her cell, <laughs> she'll give you her cell phone number, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, she manages all those campus services, family services, our guidance and counseling department, uh, a wealth of experience, uh, uh, and, and we're just really pleased. And, and it's been essentially her whole career in, in Plano ISD, so I, I appreciate that, Patty. And then Carla Oliver, Ass Assistant Superintendent for Government and Community Planning. Uh, uh, Carla puts... <clears throat> all our communications together, our uh, reach out into the community, uh, just that seamless system of information that we try to keep flowing to the, to the public and to the campuses. And uh, again, uh, sort of my right hand person when it comes to uh, crafting out uh, really delicate issues as far as uh, what we're trying to accomplish and, and also <coughs> helps me in that uh, reach to the board and, uh, and all the day-to-day the -day operations that we handle as far as public relations are concerned. So um, w one thing that you can see, uh, not to imply that any of them are old, but we, we've got a very deep, experienced, and veteran staff. And, and, and it, I can't say 
how fortunate uh, that, that Plano is to be able to attract people. They come, uh, you know, when I came to the district 12 years ago, I came as the CFO. Uh, I've got, I'm entering my 39th year in education and since you are some new faces there, I started off as a teacher coach for eight years, went back to school and got my CPA and gravitated over to the finance uh, uh, arena. Uh, I always said that when uh, we can, a, a lot of school people uh, sort of move around, uh, they're always trying, the way you increase your career, go to bigger and better places. Uh, r really, we always define Plano as your destination job. And I, and I think you can tell that from our senior staff. You can tell that from our principal staff. It's a destination job because in education, there's not a better school district in the state as far as reaching the needs of all kids and providing the level of education that we provide here in Plano. And I was very honored when the board, after asking me to serve as the interim uh, two years ago this November, uh, that after six months and, and, and really working closely with the board that uh, they named me superintendent uh, six months later. So uh, it's been a, uh, a fast year and a half in the big chair, uh, really two years if you count the interim uh, period, but it has gone well and I think we keep uh, trying to move forward. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go into my uh, normal uh, presentation. Uh, I know staff has to go to some other places, so you're dismissed. Uh, see you at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, but uh, I do uh, appreciate those opportunities, and I know several of them have speaking engagements and some are headed to the ball game. Uh, I want to uh, start off before I show you a brief video that I'm sure some of you have already seen in regard to our tax ratification election. I want to take a few minutes, though, just to comment on what I just alluded to about the success that we're having as far as academics go. <clears throat> and uh, I see a lot of faces out there that I see you in other places. I see you with the foundation, I see you at the chamber, I see you uh, involved in, in city activities, I've seen you on the campuses. So some of this you've heard before, uh, but, but I never get tired of telling it. Uh, because, because it is a success story that we have here in the district. Uh, you know, when star testing came about, uh, we were really concerned about how we would perform on that. And again, we battled the legislature and we think there is an overreach on testing every year starting in third grade. There's just too much that we have uh, going. But really what caused us a real concern, uh, really with the new STAR testing was end of course exams, which they have sort of backed off of, but they're still very real for our freshmen and sophomores and our high school students, because there's some rigorous courses that all kids have to take. Now I want you to think back to when you were in school and think that every single student went through algebra, went through biology. I mean, uh, uh, again, I think everybody took history, they took English, but it, as far as math, science, uh, to, to have that requirement, the rigorous uh, requirement that they go through these courses, which is a good thing if you can get them to that point, but also to make sure that they're successful because our intent is to have all kids college and career ready. And the state is really struggling with that effort to get everyone across the finish line. When we took the initial test, the STAR test, no one had had it, we worried a little bit about our freshman class, those taking algebra, biology, uh, English, U.S. history, and taking those tests because if they failed, they would be off their track to graduation. I mean, it, it's not up to a teacher to say, do you get the material? And, and quite frankly, kids have, some kids have a real problem and, and they struggle with standardized tests. So we were a little concerned about that. And when we got back the results, I was really pleased with how the group performed as a whole. But I had our assessment department go back and look at, at how we had done with kids that started in our elementary school, came through middle school and into high school on the exam, then middle school to high school, and then came in the year of the test, and we found out this. If they started in elementary school, went to our middle school program, and then took the test in their ninth grade year, at the end of that ninth grade year, there was a 92% success rate the very first time out. Now that's for all kids. After three to four weeks of accelerated learning for those that didn't, weren't successful, that number went to 96%. Now we graduate about 96% of our kids, which is well above the state level and the regional level, which is way down in the mid 80s. We, we also have tracked 94% of these kids go to college. 
So it did validate for us that if they start in elementary and come through the system, we're accomplishing what we set out to do to be college and career ready. When we went back and looked at those that came to us in middle school, we found that the, the success rate was 79%. When they came to us in the year of the test, their ninth grade year, that success rate was right at the state average of 59%. Now, what that does, and I've talked to our board, it validates a, a couple of things for me. Number one, that we're getting the job done, but it can't be turned overnight. Uh, also, if we have time and resources to bring those kids that might not have the home life, the ability to get that extra resource, it does take time and you can't turn it around overnight. And that's where we get the real, pro I have the real problem with just putting the performance standard on our kids as a, as a one-time test and then dictating that's how the school is. It just doesn't work that way in education. So uh, we continue to tell this success story and it's again validated with the latest SAT and ACT results. Whereas uh, the SAT, there's a, there's a big uh, hurrah in the state level uh, because they, that they've pushed into the 60 percentile or taken the, the uh, SAT test. Well, ours is at 86 percent. We also, when you look at the numbers of both the state and the region, we're a full 200 points higher on our average SAT score. And again, we stress that. We stress preparation for the SAT, for college entrance exams. On the ACT, which is a lower score, where this, the regional and the state average is right at 20, ours is at 25. Now, again, that just goes to show the, the rigor that we're trying to show as you come up through the system. If you take any uh, college prep course, like our advanced placement, our advanced <laughs> placement, we're double what the region in this particular area in the state is as far as taking advanced placement courses. And we're double where the, where the regional average and the state average is around 46% are getting that uh, success rate of, of, of uh, scoring three or higher. Ours is up around the 86 percentile. So we really do feel like with our programs and our drive and integrated curriculum that we are able to differentiate the education that we're delivering for our kids to get them prepared for college. And you as parents, I know as a parent once myself, it's, it's that constant worry, are we gonna have uh, the kids at the right place and headed in the right direction as they leave the nest, which is that college and career path. Uh, with that, just talking a little bit academics and our successes there, we gravitate into something that could be a defining moment for the district and, and really does play into the breadth and the, and, the, and the amount of programs that we're able to offer our kids. I'd like to show a short video it captures much better than what I could stumble through on the tax ratification letter uh, uh, issue. I would like for you to view this. It's on our website. You'll be able to pull it up. At the August 20th, 2013 school board meeting, Plano ISD trustees approved placing a tax ratification election on the November 5th ballot. This message is intended to inform the community about the election. In 2011, the Texas Legislature reduced funding for Plano ISD by $59 million over a two-year period. In 2013, the Legislature provided partial relief, returning 29% of Plano ISD's funds, compared to the state average of 77%. The unrestored loss is $466 per student, leaving the district with a $20 million deficit. This reduction was a financial setback which placed the district below the 2007 level of funding. Plano ISD trustees agreed upon a solution. Let the taxpayers decide. This tax ratification election, or TRE, will allow the voters of Plano ISD to adjust the tax rates that fund their schools. Plano ISD will use these funds to sustain enriched educational offerings while maintaining its track record for fiscal responsibility. The proposed financial strategy is a tax adjustment to both the maintenance and operation rate, or M&O, and the interest and sinking rate, or INS. The M&O funds salaries, utilities, and day-to-day -day operations within the district. 
the INS pays back principal and interest for prior bonded debt. The current tax rates are shown here, and these are the proposed tax rates. You can see that the M&O rate is increased by 13 cents, and the INS rate is decreased by 5 cents. This is a net increase of 8 cents. So how will this impact you financially? The increase would be $0.08 cents for every $100 in property value. For a homeowner whose house is valued at $259,201, the average home value in Plano ISD, this equates to an additional $194 per year. That cost translates to $3.73 per week, about the cost of a gallon of gas. With this proposed change, Plano ISD would maintain the second lowest tax rate in Collin County. Homeowners age 65 and older whose taxes are frozen would not see a change in their school taxes. District leadership has been able to postpone the effects on Plano ISD classrooms by using reserve funds, but this has been a short-term solution. The TRE is the last option for funding relief in order to avoid program cuts that will reduce educational services in Plano ISD. Voter approval of this tax ratification will generate $30.5 million to sustain current educational programs. With the conclusion of the legislative session and in placing the TRE before voters, it is clear that Plano ISD is facing the reality of substantial change. The community will see a difference in the way education is delivered and a restructuring of the Plano ISD organization. Without a tax ratification election, Plano ISD will face the likely reduction of more than 300 staff members. That's equivalent to the staffing of eight elementary schools. These reductions will result in an increase in classroom sizes and decreased students' educational choices. With this election, Plano ISD will receive a clear message from the school community which reflects their desire and expectations for educational programs and experiences. This video has been provided as an informational message about Plano ISD's financial structure. Thank you for watching. Okay, I think uh, that sort of defined uh, the process. I want to drill home a little bit just a few of the issues that were covered on the, the tape. And again, that video is on our website. You can go to the tax ratification election and there's a question and answer and you can certainly uh, submit questions that are, that are on your mind on uh, about where we are. Uh, School finance ha has been a complicated and complex issue w w all over the state, and the, the state's been battling several issues. Number one is the equality issue, the equity issue. Uh, the, the courts have ruled that the system wasn't equitable, that all kids should be, have the resources and the funds available to have an equal system. Uh, they, uh, the state lost in court back in 06. Uh, and, and of course, uh, the, the uh, legislature had to react and they redid the funding mechanism. And people don't remember, <laughs> of course, uh, uh, that's been a while ago, but they reduced property taxes 50 cents per $100 worth of value. In other words, the, the M&O, the operating tax rate, the one we're having the election about that's going, that we're proposing goes to $1.17, was at $1.50 and it was pushed back to $1.00. Now, uh, they, uh, the state really made a defining uh, sort of uh, throwdown with, with local districts at this point. Uh, the state uh, uh, actually uh, sort of captured some of these through some other taxes, but again, the state was booming e uh, economically and they were able to, be, to give schools more money. As a matter of fact, the most money that, we, that the districts ever received per student it's $7,800 happened in 2008, and it's been declining ever since. Now, what they did, though, is they did put school districts in a box, if you will, uh, because they said a couple of things. Number one, if the values go up on the property, that makes no difference. Every school district will get the same amount of money per student, and it will be equalized. Now, because the tax rate went down, recapture went down which you've all heard about the recapture payment at one time at that time it was like 33 percent of all the money we raised went back to the state well when they lowered the property taxes by that 50 cents a lot of that recapture also went away but at the same time 
they, they left us because we were going, but wait a minute, that 50 cents that we were raising, we got to keep 66% of it. So they, kept, they passed a law, and I credit Senator Shapiro for putting that legislation in. They said, we'll hold you harmless. You get to keep $35 million a year, which is really the community's differential in revenue than some of our other neighboring school districts. And so we rocked along like that till they ran into the problems with the economy in the state. There was a deficit or projected deficit that ended up being a big surplus, but that's another story. I call it a little bit of a bait and a switch because what they did was they reduced all schools 6%, and when they returned it, they didn't return the additional state aid for tax reduction, the 35 million. And so well, now we are equalized what all other school districts have. And with no increase in appraised value revenue stream that a city will have, a county will have, a college will have, where when the value goes up, your revenue goes up, we have one way to go up on revenue, and that's with the tax rate. So I ask our board. We went through big cuts when we lost the 6%, and we eliminated up to $26 million in our budget. And class sizes got bigger. We tried not to impact programs. But now we're to the point if we're going to go get the other 20 million that's currently budgeted deficit in the next budget year, our fund balance can handle the deficit in this year. The next year, we are going to have to look at programs. And I told the board, we need to find out from the general public, you know, but before we get we start lining up to, to get those cuts down, let's see if they agree with what the rest of Collin County has sort of said. We want to differentiate us as far as education concerns. Now, where we're in a good position is we're number 13 out of 14 school districts in Collin County on tax rate. After the tax ratification election, even if it's successful, we'll still be 13th out of 14 school districts. Now, part of the reasons why is we're built out, facilities are in good shape, we don't need a bond election, we will use some funds to supplement our technology program, our, we need to refer, refresh some of it. We need to m keep moving forward from a capital standpoint. We don't need to build any new buildings. We don't need uh, some of the things. We've, we've expanded all our schools out as far as the TEA recommended uh, uh, standard with our, with our last two renovation projects from 2008, which is uh, Bethany and Hedgeco. Uh, and so uh, you know, we, we just simply say if there's going to be funds put in instead of a bond election, this isn't a bond election, it's a tax ratification election. And it gets a little bit complicated to understand, and I want you to know. Well, you, on the ballot it'll say the, the, the rate is going up 13 cents. The board has already given the five cent reduction on the debt. We're taking that down, and we can do that from some structuring uh, programs. We're not extending any debt. Our debt was scheduled to really take a sharp decline in two years. We're leveling out some payments. We're gonna give the five cent reduction and that way it makes it easier on the taxpayer. Let's be very clear. In my 39 years in the business, I've never seen a school board that wanted to raise taxes. I mean, they have to get elected too don't they? If they already left. Uh, <laughs> will they see this tape? Uh, but uh, uh, they're, they're all about uh, m minimizing taxes and, and also being able to have quality schools. So at this point, I would be welcome to take a few questions. Uh, if, if there are any, uh, it is a little bit of a complex subject, but, but it's one I have told the board if this goes through, we can be able to get all our classes back to 22 to 1. We need to lower class sizes in our core classes. I've noticed that the class sizes have really gravitated up in our math, science, social studies, and English because those are the core classes everybody has to take. The, the courses that can be low enrollment, uh, and, and again, if you've got an elementary student, uh, these are the things you have to look forward for, to, is we have a tremendous career in tech program we have 14 different strands. We have 92 courses, accounting, computer science, uh, uh, automotive. We, we, we have a, a wide variety. And what we're seeing in other districts and what the legislature said, if you're gonna be like every other school, just worry about the core curriculum and let's, let's not worry about all that other things. We've proven, I think, from our track record, 
All those other things add to the educational experience and prepares them better uh, for the future. Uh, now, I'll pause again. Are there any questions? Yes. You're, you're, that's a good point, and that question was for the recording was could we make sure this kind of information where they find it, uh, let make sure that uh, people that get e-news and District Digest and all those different vehicles that we have. We did uh, put that when we initially, initially posted it. Again, early voting starts October 21st, and the election day is November 5th. We stayed with the uniform election dates. Uh, we will send that out in a district-wide communication and we've also made sure or requested, just requested that each campus put out through their e-news a link to those also. Uh, they have been made available. Uh, I want to say this, while we, can, we're, we're, uh, by, by state law we can give all this as information, uh, we can't uh, suggest that you vote any way, uh, whether it's a school board election, mayor, uh, legislative issue, bond election, the tax ratification, what it is very clear is we can give the information and that's what I have to do for my chair in my recommendation to the board, why are we asking for this particular tax increase. So we will be doing that. All our principals also have access to the video, the information sheets, you'll probably be seeing it in, in, uh, at your school as, as we round the corner. Uh, McKinney had some real vocal opposition to it. Now McKinney was in a situation they went from mid-level tax rate to the highest tax rate in the county. Uh, them, Allen, uh, uh, those that are, that are, that are uh, also have been uh, through those elections, uh, they, they are at the top of the chart. We're, we're very pleased we're at the bottom. It's been endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce. The city's been very responsive to it. The city of Richardson's on board. One interesting thing that came up when talking to the city, the city's done an extensive survey on what their citizens are looking for. The number one reason people move to Plano, it's the schools. I mean, it's the schools. The number one reason businesses move to, the, to, to Plano, it's the schools. So if you want to see something happen to prop your property values and, and, and the community as a whole, then you can look to some communities that have let those uh, 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 more uh, uh, required educational and public schools and we have a constant battle in sh t telling the good news of what public schools are doing and let me say this all schools are working as hard and as fast as they can to make kids successful it's just the state has grown tremendously one and a half million kids over the last 20 years I mean that's a lot of kids to, to educate when and again uh, those kids that come from poverty English language learners all the challenges that as the, as, the, as, the, uh, as the system grows, you need to meet those needs of those children. So we think we're getting there. Uh, one thing that I appreciate this group, that really, and I've, I've been in several school districts, as I said before I landed in that destination job in 2001. I haven't seen communities that have a, a, a group like this that comes together that wants to be the key communicator for your building. We want you to have the, all the information. We want you to know what's going on. We don't mind you questioning what we're doing. That's what they pay us for, to let you know that the schools are your schools. They belong to the community, and I really believe that. And so we want to meet those needs, and, and that's what we, ever, uh, we try to do every day is keep that confidence. And, and, and uh, currently, there's really no organized opposition to this. At the same time, if people just think that it just happens, it doesn't. Uh, uh, there's going to be an election on November 5th, and taxes aren't a popular subject. You know that. So we uh, understand that fully. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Uh, who can vote? Is that just you, a citizen? Is that you, as the holder? 
it, you, you, you have to be a registered voter. You have to be a registered voter, and you have to live in Plano ISD, which covers a lot of, of different cities. I mean, we're Dallas, Richardson, Murphy. Like I said, I've talked to those city councils. They understand the election that we're having. But they have to be a registered voter, and they have to live in the PISD boundaries. In other words, their kids, not, not just their kids go to school. For you, it would be the kids that go to school here. But they have to be a, a registered voter in, in our school district. Well, that you have to be a registered voter to count. Uh, to to uh, we have to ha uh, not we have to have the the to, for, if the election is successful, we need one more vote than opposing. But uh, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, d d just to say that that range of voting varies depending. We've had large turnouts. Uh, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of apathy in voting, and so uh, we fight those. Uh, those challenges. That's why it's important. We did, we think if there's a large turnout, you know, the general public at large supports schools, and so we, we're uh, we feel good about that. Yes. If if okay if if. The election isn't successful. Number one, this budget's in, and um, uh, but but they'll, you'll see budget cuts immediately. Uh, th there's one thing that I have to do, and that, again, I'm CPA and accountant, uh, and and we'll have to balance the budget. I mean, you can't spend more than you get. We're we're not the federal government. I mean, we <laughs> we we have to we have to. And this isn't a shot at them, but I mean, we we have to balance. We have to balance our budget, and so. Uh, w we will start immediately on some things. There won't be any uh, uh, personnel moves immediately. Uh, all hiring will be frozen. If uh, we we'll, we'll look to uh, to tighten up, uh, we're and this is where it really uh, uh, people say, why you have to do the people? Well, 85 percent. Let me give you a couple of numbers. 85 percent of our cost, we're in the people business. They're they're people. Now. 87% of our cost is directly in campus services. They're on your campus, 87% of the cost. Then there's another 10 to 11% that's the transportation to get there, the utilities, the maintenance to run the building. You get over here to our place and it's about 1.8%. So it, it can, the only place we have to go, we'll go and we've made across the boards, every department lost uh, uh, personnel last time, campus has lost personnel last time, but we cannot stay away from campus input, uh, impact. And so then what we'll do is, is, is we'll look at, because there's some basic non-negotiables on regular ed, we'll start looking at program cuts. And that's one of the things that will be uh, painful for our board to land on, but we'll have that plan ready to roll by January. We'll let them know for the next budget year what that would be. Right at the front first. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, in the video that we showed you, like, is it a right yes. to Yes, video yes, yes. You can give the information in a PTA meeting. Uh, that's been passed on to our principals who will be working with their PTA liaisons to talk about if they want to do it. Now, it's up to the PTA if they want to show it. So that's that they're an independent organization. So we'll let them work through that. Yes. I have two questions. Um, the eight percent that we mentioned in the video to the state, how long is sustainability? Like how long does that project have to be? Well, uh, I, I know number one, we're we're headed towards a Supreme Court decision, which I think is gonna be a little bit of relief, but I think it's two years away. Then the next legislative session will be in the following spring. The good thing about being out of hold harmless and not getting any discretionary money they can pull from us, if schools get more money, we get it now. It, it, whether the tax rate passes or not when school revenue goes up. And schools are going to need more revenue. So uh, my, my plan is, and again we will continue to, to, to tweak it, would be at least at least a three-year plan where we can look at staffing, 
raises and some things to bring our employees around. They took a tremendous uh, health insurance uh, hit this past year that we need to bring it back up a little bit. But it would be my intent that it would go to, uh, three years. Well, they, they can't do it un, un, unless the court came back and ruled and they wanted to have a special session. The governor could call that, but if not, then that would be in the spring of 2015. Yes, the gentleman back there, he's been. Yeah, um, I was just looking for clarification on, all right, this tax, the total tax that we're talking about, it's only going to be towards the Plano schools. Correct. Well, uh, yeah, okay, so let's just talk a little bit briefly here. Number one, we're in a $20 million deficit this year, okay? So we're gonna generate 30. So number one, we'll take care of the deficit. Now we will pick up some efficiencies as we end the year. We never spend all of our budget, and I'd, look for, I'd hope that maybe 1% of that would come back. And we have a lot of capital needs, which are one-time expenditures that would we use excess fund balance and other, other uh, needs that we have on capital's concern. The main thing that all I can promise you from a programmatic standpoint, I'm not looking to put in, we, we've established three new academies. You know, you've heard, I, I guess you've heard about some of those. Those can run a, a more than a, the regular track education. We raise private dollars to supplement all those. I don't want them, the, the money follows the kids on basic allotment as the state calls it, the basic amount, but then we supplement that from outside funds because I don't want to take away from those other campuses. The main thing you're going to see is more teachers. I mean, that, that's, that's where it's going to be. We, we need to put more teachers back in the classrooms. We've got, we filed, I think, 26 waivers now for, uh, for class sizes. And, and we need to get all classes down to 22 to 1 and maybe supplement some of those down below 22 to 1, but those will be discussed programmatically with the board. And then in the high schools, senior highs, middle schools, we need to continue to offer those broad range of programs. We have, we have a fine arts program that's like an, uh, any in the state. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. I mean, it's good. I mean, but, but, but you know, that is again programmatic that, that we would have to look to if this election wasn't successful. So those type of things, the number of foreign languages we offer, there's any number of things that we would look to continue on because we think we're doing it the right way. But the main thing I can promise you is you'd see our teacher counts go up. There won't be administration hires if you're looking for that. And I'll just throw this out with the last cuts. Uh, the, the cabinet Dr. Otto worked with is, is two less than, than when he was here. We, we, uh, we, we cut across the board in how we manage from this standpoint, and I want the impact to be at the campus level. Yes? With, with Richardson? Uh, yeah, Richardson has a little bit different dynamic. Number one, uh, they get county services that it was funny when the legislature years ago gave some benefits to both Harris and Dallas County that relieved them of some budgetary costs, mainly in transportation. They have a county-wide bus system that they're able to do. They can do some of those things. Also, I was looking at their numbers. Their enrollment's going up, and it's going up in a, in a weighted, we get weighted uh, attendance. And uh, their low socioeconomics number has really s exploded. And they've, they've, quite frankly, they've absorbed and done some of the things we've done with bigger class sizes, but their kids do drive more money because they're weighted higher. So uh, I will make this prediction, though. If the law doesn't change, you're going to see every school district, I don't care if you're in Dallas or Harris County, going to be asking for a tax ratification election because let me let me say again to be perfectly clear your revenue doesn't go up unless you take your rate up it's not like counties cities 
college, which gets appraised value that goes up. And again, that recapture amount, because of what the state puts in, has gone from 33% to 8%, but there's still an equalized amount for, for, for all your property money, except for six cents. Yes? I may be way behind the time. <clears throat> Right. Is that done? Is well, that over? Well, the, uh, there is still an equalized mechanism. It does, the check doesn't go to other districts. We used to do that. We were paying 130 million, 135 million a year was the most that we ever wrote a check for. And we wrote them to other districts because then we would have them buy our curriculum. Well, that's another story. But uh, we, uh, we really did work out some good deals that really did was cost effective for us. Uh, <clears throat> that all went away. It does go to the state. We could take a vehicle where it's netted. Uh, it's sort of like you pay your quarterly taxes up front. We, we prefer to do it at the end and not have it netted out of our state money. So we don't do the net effect. We still send a portion of our revenue to the state. It's only 8% of our, of our money. It's right around 30 million. Uh, so it's gone from 135 million to 30 million, but there's still an equalized mechanism in place. You only get so much per student that you get to retain. Yes. Um, changing the stuff off here, you mentioned that 96% uh, of uh, our uh, students graduate from right. high school. Right. Does that count the GED people? No. Okay. No. It's, it's, a, it's a track, and, and some of them it takes five years to get them through, but that's the, that's the number that, that, that we graduate on our regular PISD plan, but there are those that then come back and do the GED and those other, other ways to get it. Yes? Would, uh, you mentioned that there's the equalization program where you're going to get so much per student. Right. Is this money subject to that kind of effect from the state, or? <clears throat> no, there, there's an equalized portion that will go back to the state. Uh, and and uh, again, we've talked to others that have said, man, I, I, wouldn't, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do this because some of it goes back and, and it, you know, it's that old sales tax thing. Uh, you know, do I want the revenue because I got to pay some sales tax on it. Uh, it it's, a, it's a revenue source. And, and let me, uh, this is a good opportunity to say, that's what we're in the court system about right now. We say that makes it a statewide property tax. I feel confident we're going to win at the Supreme Court level. <clears throat> We've won at the district level. It's reviewed in January again. I think that we could get a real windfall in two to three years after the courts decide, but I think it'll be at least two years before we know that. We couldn't wait that long because we have to have a balanced budget. Now, Boards can lower rates if you do get that kind of windfall, and I and I work with a board that they would take the cut. <laughs> Is that one reason you said deficit's 20 million, but the financial impact would be say 35 million? Well, it's it's going to be yeah, it's going to be 30. That's going to be our net amount that we that we're going to get, and we'll also we're going to use that because we're not having a bond issue. You know, we talked about having a bond and a tax ratification less uh, at the same time. Uh, number one financial planning, I would rather take that additional money that we are over our deficit and put into the capital program to, to buy computers and upgrade those systems and compliance, roofs, HVAC, those big capital purchases will be with that excess money that will be one time that then can run, that can move back to our operating expenditure as we go in that second and third year. Yes. Right. 
right well there's there's and this is what the link will go out the link comes back to a page that gives information and other uh, uh, items question and answers that we that we've had asked by citizens that we've come back and posted the answer to it uh, I will say this, we stayed away, and, and this was just me, superintendent, I didn't want this to turn into a program election where you put out a laundry list, and we did, you can go back into our board agenda and see all the different areas that we talked about that would be impacted. Uh, I preferred to say that uh, if this fails, then we'll have to come back and see what programs that we can still hit all the things that we need to hit from a state standpoint and then what programs we can continue to offer with the depth that we have. I, I guess the, be, the best way I can say it is if, if and, the, and that's what the video said, we're, we're gonna need to eliminate 320 or so positions if this fails to get balanced. And those, you can just take the percentage, is gonna be a lot from the classroom, a lot from the campus, and then of course from here but you're just gonna see more kids in the classroom. You're gonna see less programs. Yes? Is there anything else on the ballot for that particular day or is the only thing that we No, uh, there'll be some other issues. I think there's some constitutional amendments. Uh, I don't think that this is a big uh, election uh, time for, uh, for, for officials of any sort. I think the ballot is as light as I've seen the November ballot. Uh, so it'll 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 jump out pretty quickly with with those that are voting, but we do have to just to save money again. We have the joint election with the county and the city on on those things. And I don't think the city has anything on the ballot. Uh, it'll it'll be pretty prominent on the ballot. Yes. Um, you talk about lowering the debt service rate by restructuring uh, portions. Right. Of bonds. Um, why couldn't that have done? Why couldn't you do that earlier? What are the details? Okay, bond, okay, good. Let's take the first one uh, about what you can spend bonded indebtedness on. When you vote for a bond election, the citizens are saying they're willing to spend so much money in capital. I think our last bond issue was like $490 million that was spent over a six year, it really run over an eight year period for capital. And that involved new schools, additions, bringing uh, renovated uh, older schools up to standard and it, it involves capital. It's like your uh, house, it's, it's a capital improvement. And we fund those over 25 years for building costs. Technology is amortized over five years. Uh, buses are, kept, uh, are amortized over 10 years because they're a capital purchase. It's almost like paying off a note, figuring out what their life cycle is, and then paying that, that as debt. That is all you can move, use that money for. I can't take debt service money or capital bonded proved money back to the m &O operating. It is two distinct items. And the voters get a real, they get to say if you're gonna have this debt. Now the board has to set the debt limit and the debt has to be paid uh, annually. Now let me say this about our debt structure. We're the, there's only two school districts in the state with AAA bond rating. It's us and one other. I think it, they don't have any debt because they don't have any uh, building program. But we have the highest bond rating in the state because we're the best risk. They, and they do that by looking at our financials, looking at our property values, looking at the way we've managed our debt, and then they rate us, standards and poors rates us before every bond sale. Now, why haven't we done that restructure before? We have. We've restructured and saved the district over the last six years as bond rates went down. We've restructured some debt that have saved the district over $40 million on the debt side. That's one reason that you're seeing, a, you're gonna see a sharp decline in our debt rate. We haven't extended any debt either. Some school districts have taken that debt on out. We don't, we wanna shorten it. Then, then the, other, the other thing that, uh, that, we, that we can't do is, you can only do a refunding and a restructure so many years after you levy or issue the debt. So we're waiting on some timing and timing is good. I've lived a good life. Timing's good. 
timing's good on this debt restructure. And when we looked at the debt restructure for this bond, we, we really feel like we've still got to have it come in in the next month or so to do this restructure. I told the board because they're reducing it five cents. If we can't restructure and get advantageous true savings on that refunding, then we will pay that debt payment. You can go from M&O to debt, but you can't go from debt to M&O. You can only go one way. So we would pay it out of fund balance as a backstop. And we do have, uh, we, we've, uh, we've managed it financially where we would have a debt and a fund balance. And that's what I'm also trying to stay away from. When we, if we, if we don't pass the tax ratification election and we have that $20 million uh, deficit, we, we have, we are still within our policy limit for how much de uh, fund balance we're, we're required and I can keep that high bond rating. I don't want to compromise the finances of the school district both from a bond rating standpoint and an operation standpoint. That's why I'm committed then to, to cutting the budget and not keep deficit spending. Yes? Good question. What would be a favorable result? Well, number one, uh, there were th there were several issues: state property tax, equity, and adequacy were the three issues that they ruled against the state on. They've solved the at the the equity issue, I believe, because if you if you get us equalized, you just about got the state equalized. There's still some refinement areas that are that are still unequitable. They get more than 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 some school districts. So they've solved that equity. The state property tax inadequacy in the lower court, they ruled that the schools were underfunded by over $2,000 per student. Now, if they, you know, again, now the state's got to generate it. Now, I'll say this, and I'm not second guessing what the state did when they gave all the taxpayers that 50 cent reduction. That was a good deal. It, just think about that. You go, you go back and look at what property taxes you paid in 2005, and they're higher than what you would pay with this tax rate election. Taxes are lower than they were back in 04, 05, and 06. Well, they gave up a lot of revenue. Now, it sort of worked out for them, but they're also at the courthouse saying that they need to be funded schools. Let me say this, and I'll get on a soapbox here. You let education crumble in the state of Texas, the state of Texas will be behind the eight ball. There won't be businesses and economy and growth if they let the education system go under because that's their only way out for a lot of kids is education. Maybe yeah. one more? One more. Good, I'm getting hoarse. <laughs> Well, uh, I, again, I'll say that there's a good turnout. I, don't, I, I, wouldn't, I would never guess at how many votes it would take. Uh, uh, I, I think last, in our last board election, I, th I think the most votes a, a candidate got was like 10,000, 11,000, 12,000, uh, so, somewhere in that. We've had elections, we've had bond elections that have passed with 4,000 votes. I, th there is just no way to judge what the turnout will be. That, that's why we just want the, 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 ta the taxpayers, this community, to understand what we're asking because I'll still say this, and it's my underlying confidence in general public. They want good schools. I want to see a large turnout. And then we'll let the chips fall where they may. And let me say this. If the community says that they want lower taxes, we'll keep lower taxes and we'll cut, we'll cut the budget. But that's, that needs to be a choice of the community. And so... That number, I just can't land on a magic number that I think that it might be. It could, it could be anywhere. All right. And now you get to talk about security for a little while. It's our <laughs> police car out front. So uh, uh, hope, hope no one goes home cuffed. Uh, but uh, no. No. I, <laughs> thank you very much. Let me just say, too, that I didn't get to tell you earlier that, uh, that um, Superintendent Matkin was recently awarded the designation of Distinguished Alumni by his al alma mater, Austin College. So I'd like to congratulate him on that.
And if I can take a stab on your, your last question, Mr. Mackin, um, the, the difference in getting the, the results that we need if we want, if you want, as voters, to, to get this additional funding is not the number of people coming to the, the polls, while we do want as many people as possible to come to the polls, it could take, as he said earlier, one vote. And we ask you as, as uh, key communicators to share the information with your campuses. That doesn't mean you can't share it with your neighbor, can't share it with the, the people when you're at the grocery store. I think the thing that will turn the tide one way or the other is for people to have the information they need. So we want you to share the information, to, to get the video, uh, people to know about the video, to use, if you saw in your folder, there is a, a um, one sheet on, on the information, and that again will be on the website. So you can download that, you can put that in your newsletters in, on your campuses, you can share that wherever you're going, at the pediatrician's office, wherever you choose to do. We're not asking you to do that, but if you truly want to share that information, then we encourage you to do so. So, one of the things that we've talked a lot about is money tonight, uh, but when we look at the, the things that are key to our parents, ac academics obviously are number one, but the other thing that is very, very close behind that is the security, safety and security of our children. So we're asking Joe Parks to come in tonight. Joe, if you'll come with, uh, up here with me. He's the Director of Safety and Security for the ISD, and he's gonna share what's new with how we're keeping our children safe. Mr. Parks. Thank you. Well, you know, while I was sitting in the back listening to Mr. Matkin, a couple of things struck me. First of all, he, he didn't use a single note. And I, I, I told uh, Steve Fortenberry, my gosh, I have to check my name on the top of my notes before I get going. But the other thing was I, I, I'm very struck by the engagement of the, of the folks that are here and the, the interest y'all take in your children and, and the school district. And I think that's, uh, that's what makes PISD great. And so without further ado, uh, the last time we spoke, I think was in March, and that was shortly after the Sandy Hook tragedy that, that everybody uh, uh, has horrified the nation. Um, talk about, we talked about a couple of things then that I'm just going to rehash real briefly. Um, uh, PISD, like every other school district in the United States, shortly after Sandy Hook began evaluating and reviewing their security procedures, looking for uh, improvements or changes to their processes that they could do, uh, make to improve their security. Um, but some of those, um, the options, there's so many options, there's a lot of different things that uh, have to be considered. Uh, the size of the district, um, a lot of factors that go into what sort of security measures you want to, you want to try to uh, uh, put in place. Um, but it, it all sort of boils down to, you know, people have different preferences about, they want to talk about metal detectors or teachers with guns or school marshals or bulletproof glass, all these different things. If you boil all the security concerns in a school down to three things, your, your objective is really three things. It's, it's keeping the threat outside the door whenever possible. If a threat gets inside the school, to minimize or slow access of the threat to victims. And it's to get the, the help, the cavalry, the first responders uh, on the way as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I talked about the, the different options that, that uh, we reviewed and that were suggested and, and you, you've seen probably in numerous discussions on the news about what different districts are doing but what, what we have to remember is that uh, you know a lot of people say well you know th that costs too much or that that type of improvement is too expensive it's not just about the cost uh, the school board has been amazingly supportive of security in the school district, but even if they were to give me an unlimited budget, okay, and, and we said, you know what, we're gonna make every school 100% uh, safe from any type of possible threat. I mean, we, we could make them resistant to a nuclear blast, but the problem is when you do that beyond a certain degree, you can't use that building for a school anymore. 
um, there have to there has to be features um, features and um, you know flow of people and openness uh, in a school to allow it to be used to, to instruct students so that's another thing um, also a lot of focus uh, and, and it, it probably continues to this day and I worry about this there's a lot of focus following Sandy Hook on you know that armed intruder people people are focused on that armed intruder there are a broad spectrum of, of threats to to any school district and we want to make sure that we're not so focused on that you know one in a million horrible instance or possibility that we lose focus of, of the other things that are not as not as horrific but still serious but much more probable so that's what we've tried to do uh, when we develop the the three major security initiatives that that we've uh, worked towards this year uh, to begin this this year uh, hopefully y'all have seen some of these at the campuses that your your children attend uh, we've rolled out the campus protection plan uh, we're a good ways into the renovations of about 50 schools uh, to renovate the front entries and we're uh, moving into a testing phase of installing what I call no delay uh, mobile panic buttons in our elementary schools and I'm going to just update you on those three initiatives uh, the first which is the most visible you all saw the squad car out front uh, is our campus protection program and basically we we are contracting with off-duty police officers from a number of different police departments uh, Texas Highway Patrol state troopers uh, Collin College Police Richardson Plano Murphy a number of departments and they're contracting to work for us during their off-duty hours as campus protection officers or CPOs and basically what what they do they, they are assigned to specific areas within the district they're assigned to patrol specific schools and their objective is to is to patrol those schools as frequently uh, every day as, as they can um, they have no other duties other than patrolling the schools uh, and responding to a, a serious life-threatening emergency uh, we've probably talked in the past a little bit about the uh, district-wide emergency radio system we have well all of the officers that work for us uh, in this program are given a, a handheld radio that has the same radio channel that all the campuses have the squad cars have those radio channels and we've been able to nego negotiate agreements with uh, several of the police departments that are that we have schools in to put the actual police department radio channel in the uh, the radios that our officers use um, PISD is a big place uh, we have schools in five different cities we deal with five different law you know five different police departments where our schools are uh, cover a hundred square miles 72 schools it's a big place so uh, it was a sort of a complicated endeavor to get uh, the jurisdiction of officers that we needed who could patrol in areas that we needed them to patrol and have them be able to communicate both uh, with the schools and with the police departments in the cities that they're patrolling in um, uh, most of the officers that are in the program are, are patrolling in in the squad cars that you like you, the one you saw out front it's a generically marked uh, Ford uh, police Ford Ford Police SUV Interceptor Ford Explorer. Um, it, it, it's, it's a real police car. It has red lights and siren in it uh, so they can respond in an emergency. Um, but again, their, their primary focus is on uh, high visibility preventative patrol of the, of the designated campuses and to respond in a true emergency to the campus but acting in concert with the local on duty officers. You know, as you might imagine uh, training and communication uh, and tactics vary from city to city so in that in that emergency situation we want to make sure that the officers that are contracting with us are working in concert with the other officers from a city uh, who might be responding uh, one uh, additional luxury if you will that we have with this program is its flexibility 
and from time to time, you know, I tell people a, a lot of the time uh, a good part of my job is, is managing hysteria more, more than it is managing a, an actual critical incident. Uh, Y'all have probably all uh, heard of or been touched by some of the social media uh, type incidents where you have a statement that's made at the school grounds, it gets blown up over social media, Twitter, text messages, you know, it goes from zero to, to DEFCON 5 because these rumors just get bigger and bigger. Uh, you've got the kids texting mom and dad saying, I'm scared to come to school, come get me. Um, and you know, some of them are really scared. Some of them just want the excuse to come home, but it creates, it creates a big mess. So we work very closely with the local law enforcement uh, uh, and criminal investigations divisions of the police department on deals like that to, to start backtracking those rumors, see if there are criminal charges that can be filed, uh, and the police handle that part as far as the, the discrete investigation of, of those types of threats. But we're left with a campus that sometimes is in an uproar, and, and sometimes they're in an uproar really uh, based on no true credible threat, but the way rumors circulate in 2.8 milliseconds, you know, we're, we can find ourselves behind the eight ball. So oftentimes what we will do is we'll put off-duty officers in a school to, to let people know we've got officers in the school, they see the, the police there, uh, bring the stress level down, get things calmed back down. Well, in the past, uh, some of these events evolved you know, on Sunday night at nine o'clock. And so we would be scrambling to locate off-duty officers who could come in on a Monday or whatever. Well, now in the right circumstance, we, we have officers that will, you know, are on duty for us uh, every school day during school hours that in the right circumstance, we could divert to a campus long enough to get, you know, someone else to replace them. So there, there's another uh, bonus there. Um, What I want to make sure people understand are some things that what the what the program is not. Okay, um, these officers are not uh, there to provide general law enforcement services, uh, such as in, you know ongoing investigation of criminal matters. Uh, we we have not started a, a Plano ISD police department, uh, and 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 these officers are not there to be uh, school resource officers. Uh, we we. We feel like we've done a good job in, in getting the officers to uh, engage the campuses and, and the campuses have embraced them and engaged with them, have the uh, officers walking through the campuses. Uh, the, 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 the response has been really good, but we just want to make sure that people don't ever misconstrue what the focus of the program is. It, it's not to create a police department, it's, it's to provide two very focused objectives. One is to have the ongoing patrol, and hopefully those of you in, with children in elementary and uh, middle schools have seen those officers on your children's campuses a lot, um, and to provide just another layer uh, of, of police response with no other duties other than to be attentive to PISD uh, to provide hopefully a faster response if there was a serious life-threatening emergency. Uh, the other thing we're, we're working on is the renovation of the school entrances or target hardening. You know, a lot of the schools were built uh, back when security maybe was not at the forefront of, of everyone's consideration. And you probably noticed some of the campuses, if you come in the front door, um, you're sort of on the honor system as to whether you go into the office or not, or you just hang a quick right and go into the library or down the hallway into the secure areas of the school. So uh, the district has worked with an architect to uh, come up with plans to renovate about 50 campuses. Uh, and the objective is to create a physical barrier so that when someone comes in uh, the front door of the school, they, they have no option other than to be funneled into the office. And once they're in the office, they have to go out a different door to go into the, uh, the security area of the school. Um, if you look at this, I'm using Stinson Elementary because this is one of the campuses that is just about finished. If you look at that schematic uh, in the 
upper right hand corner if you see the the green doors the uh, and I don't have a laser pointer I don't think but if you see the green doors those are new locking doors that will be locked on the entry side of the school um, before those doors were there and I've tried to depict it with the arrows um, people were supposed to go follow the green arrow into the office but because there's no barrier you know you, you could have someone follow the red air, arrow and go into the school they've now constructed the uh, the doors and storefront across that that entryway so that now if you look at that red dotted line you have to go into the office and then once you're in the office you have to go out that other door which is in the sort of the upper left hand corner of the slide uh, to get into the secure areas of the school um, this is not the greatest photograph I'm not a really good photographer but if you were standing coming in the front doors of Stinson uh, that photograph on the left uh, if you look at the the dark colored uh, doors those are the new doors and there's two sets of them so it, it blocks off uh, the entryway from the remainder of the school uh, the yellow arrow on the left you know points into the office that's the that's where uh, you have to go and then the close-up on the right is a that's a close-up photo of the inside of the door jam of that uh, office door uh, the office door uh, that leads from the entryway into the office will have a, a new lock on it that's uh, one of the remote buzz-in locks that the campus can activate or deactivate depending on what's going on in the campus so during the normal school day they would ordinarily keep that locked uh, so that's going to create a, another barrier to someone coming in the office you know if, if they were recognized as uh, you know potentially posing a security concern uh, the other thing and the, the last of our, our big three initiatives is uh, the no delay mobile panic buttons all of all of our campuses already have panic buttons in them uh, the the these new buttons that we're focusing on the elementary schools to install uh, are a little different um, these are you know, you've seen the commercials for I've fallen and I can't get up well these are like that on crack okay uh, these these are these are wired uh, to a essentially a police radio and when they're activated it transmit an, it transmits an emergency signal through the radio uh, almost instantly directly to the police dispatchers radio console okay it, it not not 911 and through phone lines it goes to the person who is sitting by the microphone that dispatches the police officers so we, we have this system currently installed in one elementary school and are in a testing phase. Um, we're, we're, our target is to have four more of them installed in other schools in the different cities that we have schools in because each of these requires a separate negotiation with the local police department because we have to have their permission to, to accept this signal and have procedures worked out that, that, that they will you know respond to these the way we we want them to and, and we have obligations to make sure we're not you know the boy who cried wolf and have these things pushed for uh, non-urgent situations but anyway in the, in the testing that we've done uh, from the moment one of these buttons is pushed uh, that police dispatcher gets that signal in about seven seconds so Theoretically, uh, if there was a, a life-threatening emergency on campus and one of these buttons was activated, I mean, you could feasibly have police dispatched and en route in, you know, 15 or 20 seconds. Um, I, I don't want to disclose exactly how many buttons we're giving to the campuses, but we're giving a number of buttons to the campuses uh, with the idea that they would be dispersed to personnel uh, sort of in a imperfect perimeter if you will uh, and core office staff uh, so that we have more eyes and ears in different areas of the school that, that if an emergency arose they could they could hit that button um, there's some other technological features of this that I don't, I don't want to get too much in the weeds with but uh, there are features that allow uh, or will potentially allow our contract officers to receive a text message 
whenever one of these buttons is pushed, as well as uh, core office staff uh, in the campus and, the, and security personnel with the district. So there's some bells and whistles with this that we think are very promising. Uh, like I said, we're shooting to get the four, uh, or the total of five test sites up and running by the end of this month. Uh, need to do some final uh, training of staff and, and, uh, and talk with the police departments about procedures and expectations. Uh, and then uh, assuming this does everything that it looks like it will do so far, and we've confirmed that, we'll try to roll this out to the rest of the uh, elementary schools by the end of the, the school year. Um, that's the, the high points of our, our security initiatives. Um, I think we might have discussed it last year. We, we've imposed some other things as far as additional emergency drills. Uh, every campus is doing a, lock, a lockdown drill four times a year. Um, so some, other, some other standards like that. But these are the most visible, uh, uh, biggest things, uh, biggest initiatives, and just wanted to give you an update on that. So, I'm, I'm happy to answer a, a few questions. I know it's getting late, but I'm happy to answer some questions if you have any. Yes, sir, in the back of the room. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the first. Yes. Um, well, and it's and it's it's important to, to keep the two separate. Um, we we are we are directing the campuses to continue anytime they need the police, whether it's for an emergency or non-emergency, to continue to call 911 so that the local on-duty police respond. If if it is if it's a, a critical life-threatening emergency. We would ordinarily be notified by Plano PD if it was a school in Plano, uh, and, and we could uh, have the CPO unit respond as well. But the, the two are really separate. Uh, I, I haven't seen the, any, the, the most recent response time uh, data from Plano PD, but you know, the, it, it always hovers around five minutes on a priority one call. Um, and, and for example, Murphy, Murphy has a one minute average response time, but they're, they're small and they can do that. So, yes, ma'am. Just noticed a lot of this is focused on elementary schools. Is there any concern about that to the other schools as time passes on, or do you not have need in the high school? Schools? Uh, the, the patrols are focused on elementary schools because uh, elementary and middle schools. Uh, because in the high schools and senior highs, we already have a school resource officer, a full-time police officer in all of those schools. Um, the, uh, the panic buttons, uh, we are starting with the elementary schools, uh, A, because it's a more vulnerable population, and B, because of, uh, of the cost. Um, I, I will not be surprised if uh, the panic button system, once it's up and tried, uh, doesn't expand beyond the elementary schools, but it, it's, uh, we're using some bond funds to, to get the, the elementary schools covered. We'd have to look at how to finance uh, the remainder of the schools. Yes, sir. So have you done any studies on congestion uh, as you add these new fall for people to come in? How does that affect the, how the students and the faculty enter the building during, during normal times or after? after an outdoor activity that we look at whether the funneling that uh, impacts how, how the school builds up kind of thing. Um, the the entry the, the the renovations is just to the front entryway. Uh, and and during the the you know the morning rush hours they they may continue to do like they do now. They'll have you know they have staff members that are posted at the doors and they hold the doors open because there's really no other way to get that many kids in the school without doing that. Uh, the architect uh, that designed it, you know, they, they certainly did this with an eye towards the, the life safety part as far as egress and ingress, uh, well, egress particularly, uh, as far as timing or studies on uh, uh, 
delays getting in, I, 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 we haven't, we have not done that. Yes, ma'am. Good to hear that. And, and you know that the, the, the fact of the matter is, and, and uh, you know, we we get some pushback from time to time when security is telling educators we want more locks on doors and we want doors closed and locked, because because it does impact the flow of the campus. It can impact the feel of the campus, um, and, and we really do try to strike a happy balance. But you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, more security is more inconvenient, and, and we try to minimize that but um th that's just a, a fact of, of the animal sometimes yes okay. Well, okay one more question yes sir in the back of the room what's the overall budget you have for my entire department no for this over three steps i heard the panic button the patrol cars and the officers and the improvements on these buildings sure for this how much do you have okay uh, the panic buttons, uh, once we get all the, uh, the elementary and ECS schools, that, that is uh, just shy of $400,000. Uh, the first year of the campus protection program is about $750,000. It'll drop to under $500,000 uh, per year after that. On the, the building renovations, facilities, and new construction is handling the financing of that. I'm not sure what the total cost of that. I've seen some figures of, I mean, just off the top of my head, uh, some of the figures I've seen on individual schools look like uh, some of them are about fifteen to twenty thousand uh, dollars renovation uh, on a per school basis, but that will vary. Some of the schools are easy uh, to renovate and some are much more complicated, but I, I don't have a figure for the last uh, part. Well, if I could just say, because uh, uh, I, I see some of the feedback in the paper, um, that the, the Campus Protection Officer Program, uh, even including the initial year of purchasing the cars, is, was uh, considerably less than what it would cost for our half of the cost to put a school resource officer only in the 14 middle schools. Um, you know, everybody would like to have a police officer in every campus, and, 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 I, and I, I am jealous sometimes when I see on the news that this school district has done it, but most of the time they have like eight schools, and we have 72. Uh, and and I'll, I'll just throw this figure out to you. For us to put a police officer in all 72 campuses, um, even, even if we were to split the cost with a city, and they can't do it right now, probably. I mean, that if we split the cost, we would probably be looking at five to six million dollars a year, uh, and that's a low ball number. One officer. One officer in, in, in this. It's right. Um, Okay, I, I, I'm getting the evil eye. I'm gonna go one more, <laughs> one more. Yes, I'm protecting their time. Okay. Actually, um, this predates my getting to the district a little bit, but that, uh, there actually was, they used to have SLOs in the middle schools, uh, and because of economy and budget cuts on, on not just the school district's part, but the city's part, uh, that they were, they were eliminated, um, I'm gonna say four years ago, but uh, I'd love to see them too, uh, but again, it's uh, the SLOs, we, we split the cost with the hosting city, uh, and, and sometimes that's just not, not feasible right now. But I, I'm, I 
I certainly noted your comment, and, and I'm, I'm on board with you, absolutely. Help me thank Mr. Parks. Thank you. Yes, I do have the hook. But the point is, I am trying to protect your time. We do try to, to make sure that this is reasonable time for you. And you get all the information as you need. As I said earlier, though, you will not get all your questions answered. So please use the email addresses at the bottom of your agenda. If you have additional questions, we do want you to get those answers. So please email those, those uh, people and ask your questions, and they'll get back to you in a reasonable point of time. Any questions so far in general about your job as key communicator? I do appreciate your time. I want to hear back from you the next meeting as to what you've done and how you've shared your information, so be prepared for that. Um, take, take your time and um, go home safely, but my point for you is I do appreciate everything you're doing, not only through key communicators, but everything you're doing as parents. So please uh, continue to do so. Make sure that your children are as safe as, as our district is trying to make them and have a good evening. Thank you, good night. Thank you.